Good morning, everybody, and welcome to If I Had a Second Chance, learning from my surgical mistakes. We all have come across cases during our career, during fellowship, during training, in consultancy, and even later on. And we do come across challenges every day. And Vitaretna is there with its own set of challenges. Today we are here to discuss and learn from our mistakes. I like to invite Dr. Ashra Nayaka, senior consultant at Eye Foundation, Eye Hospital, to start with the first case, the supracoroidal nightmare. We'll have ample time to discuss. We we can take one question after each case as well. Thank you. Can you play the intro video? There's an intro video also. Yeah. So. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would be talking on if I had a second chance with the supracoroidal nightmare. So uh, this was a case uh, which uh, patient already had a supracoroidal hemorrhage, and the patient was a 79-year-old female. Came with complaints of uh, pain since one week, uh, and uh, it was uh, constant in nature and uh, gradually increasing. and uh, uh, in the intraoperative notes of the patient patient already had a figo emulsification one week earlier with uh, uh, while doing a, while injecting the iol there was a malfunction of the injector and uh, postural capsular uh, rupture happened and uh, while the surgeon who was actually attempting to put a three piece iol in the sulcus there was a supracoroidal detachment so uh, in this patient the there was a prompt closure of all the surgical wounds and uh, then uh, was later referred for uh, vr uh, management and you could see here the uh, uh, kissing choroidals uh, here in the uh, at presentation and uh, with the course of oral steroids uh, we could uh, actually reduce the level of uh, choroidal detachment which was uh, also had a um, quite a, a thick uh, hemorrhage uh, and with time uh, it uh, cleared but what happened was the patient was uh, very much irregular on treatment the cornea decompensated and uh, we were a bit uh, uh, skeptical about the fu- future management on sfil but again the patient lo- was lost to co- uh, 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 was lost to follow up and then she developed rd so this rd was n- not a, a very simple rd because patient had uh, underwent a temporal phaco and you could see on the temporal side they were uh, uh, breaks and uh, with some internal contracture as well so this uh, this uh, this made the pvd induction extremely difficult so there was a uh, cortical sheet of vitreous and uh, Uh, and it was extremely difficult to settle this retina even with pfcl and finally uh, uh, we somehow try to uh, uh, do the complete vitrectomy and uh, settle the retina but uh, finally patient did have a recurrent uh, redetachment with internal contracture so these are the cases where we generally uh, can uh, could have been managed better if the surgeon had noted about uh, uh, while entry implanting the, the three piece iol if they had uh, managed it more conservatively we could have uh, avoided all these complications so uh, since uh, even though the, uh, the um, supracoroidal uh, hemorrhage incidence is around 0.03% after phaco emulsification it does occur and that occurs due to the rupture of post uh, uh, short posterior ciliary arteries and if it's massive uh, it uh, it can be uh, and it can be massive and uh, and it can be very difficult to stop so the, basically when the hypotony occurs uh, there is choroidal effusion that stretches and ruptures uh, the uh, necrotic long or short uh, posterior ciliary artery and uh, that is why prevention is better than cure so uh, you need to be aware of the risk factors especially when you have a complication and we have to anticipate uh, from the early signs uh, and uh, these early signs can be pain in a, in the middle of the surgery loss of red reflex enlargement of the pupil shallowing of the anterior chamber or forward displacement of the iris so similarly i had a, uh, uh, we had another case where patient had a complication 
and uh, was uh, uh, there was an increase in operating time. So here, even when they fixed the iris clip IOL, it started tilting. So they try to manipulate with uh, the, uh, the um, uh, with the dialer and the inclination forceps. So at this point of time, you could see there is a evolution of suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Can you see here? The, the, there is a small uh, bl blob of, if you can uh, notice here. So the, the, these are the cases with the, the, the like. Uh, you can, uh, if not noticed early, can have a expulsive choroidal hemorrhage. At this point of time, uh, uh, it is very, very important to identify uh, these signs earlier and notice this small change of, on what's happening on the table, not uh, only focusing on the IOL. At this point, uh, then uh, it is the, uh, to manage this, uh, it is very important to understand the mechanism. The only the pressure of the collected blood can stop the bleeding. So the only mantra is uh, approximate the wound edges with forceps, suture the wound at the earliest for the, and for penetrating keratoplastic cases, use temporary K-Pro. So in this case, uh, uh, we just sutured the uh, wounds with, um, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, tightly closed those wounds. Uh, th that was enough to manage this case. But uh, then, it is very important to know the don'ts, that is not to do a primary external drainage as it uh, defeats the whole purpose of tamponading effect of the blood and then the clots can be very difficult to train. So the so it what needs to be done is a stepwise secondary procedure and uh, use oral steroids and drain it not less than uh, seven days and not later than 14 days. So the uh, this paper clearly shows that uh, longer the case, greater the problem. So uh, when you have a, a huge choroidal detachment, you should be aware and anticipating all the problems. And this is a safer technique. This is my second chance. You have to create a second chance to manage these cases. So you can directly go and do a sclerotomy, but it is very, uh, it is uh, more safer if you create a, a small uh, scleral uh, pocket or a tunnel and allow this dark blood, which is the uh, uh, lysed uh, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, uh, to drain out from the uh, suprachoroidal space. And once uh, you once you do this, uh, the, the uh, coral detachment completely doesn't uh, disappear. But you don't have to go and uh, uh, drain it till the last uh, uh, drop. So once uh, you are done with it, you can do the uh, complete the vitrectomy. And uh, if, if possible, remove if there is any nuclear fragments. And, uh, uh, and this paper clearly shows that uh, out of 23% of suprachoroidal hemorrhage uh, lands up in no polite perception. Can, we can have irreparable retinal detachment, uh, persistent hypotonia, and hypothesis bulbi. So small hemorrhages can be managed conservatively with uh, good visual prognosis. Uh, and with my massive choroidal hemorrhage needs to have stepwise secondary uh, surgery and drainage through anterior and posterior sclerotomies and uh, vitrectomy for breakthrough hemorrhage and retained lens matter is essential and vitrectomy for RD can be extremely tough. So uh, managing it conservatively in the first attempt is extremely crucial. So now, uh, now all these, uh, the, uh, the most thing is to identify the early signs and avoid primary drainage, close the wound and you will get a second chance. Thank you. And this is what uh, is my take-home message. Uh, we take the question in the end. Thank you, Dr. Ashray, for the lovely presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Shishir Vargas, a young and dynamic young surgeon practicing in Kerala, and he's uh, very, very uh, busy on Instagram posting his surgical videos. Great surgeon. Yeah, so uh, thank you AIOS and Dr. Weber for the opportunity and inviting me as a co-instructor for this IC and also providing a title for my uh, presentation. So title is stuck in the sweet web, no conflicts of interest. So the spider represents diabetes and diabetic retinopathy and it weaves a web in which all the patients get stuck around it. So all those insects caught in the web are basically patients affected with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy and they all get you know stuck in that web of diabetes and get consumed by it and we as vitro retinal surgeons also get stuck along with them and managing their retinopathy and other uh, complications related to diabetic retinopathy
So a spider can make different types of webs, different species of spider makes different types of webs. And similarly, when diabetic retinopathy presents to you, they can also create webs like these, small ones, then extensive, little bit more bigger ones. You have these advanced fractional detachments, and then even more really extensive, huge ones covering almost all the, uh, from, from the retina. So I'm presenting a case of a 60-year-old female with decreased vision, both eyes since two years, diabetic hypertensive dyslipidemia with early diabetic nephropathy, uh, no trauma, she was wheelchair bound, the right eye vision was PL and the left was PL negative, lost to neovascular glaucoma. The anterior segment had immature cataract in both eyes. So this was a presentation, you can see in the right eye a huge extensive uh, uh, tabletop fractional retinal detachment in the right eye and the other one having a huge uh, detachment at the, only at the center but the eye was lost to neovascular glaucoma. So the right eye was only perception of light. So this was the OCT taken, you, you cannot make out the retina just that it's lifted up and then you can see the extensive uh, membranes which are, and along, uh, which are very adherent to the vitreous. So after the cataract surgery, decided to do a 20, 25 gauge pass planar vitrectomy. So after a core vitrectomy, it was extremely difficult to find the plane for dissection, which can be really difficult in these uh, diabetic cases. So I used a pick to get the plane and fortunately I managed to get a plane. And then using the ocutome, I got a plane and then managed to dissect. And at least I wanted to free the macula from the a membrane yeah so these cases can bleed extensively you can either give preoperative anti vegf and e every time you see a bleeder you need to cauterize cauterize it so after you dissect uh, adequately now i felt that i could see the macula at least and i could figure out where the disc was so this was a time where i could not uh, manage further with three ports so then i decided to put a chandelier and start with the bimanual dissection. So using the forceps and lifted up the membrane and then trying to dissect with the cutter itself. But the vitreous was very, very adherent uh, till it was only getting induced till up to the equator. You can see I'm trying to alternate with the cutter and the scissors to dissect the membranes. Yeah, so I reached a point where I could not uh, further, uh, you know, uh, engage in extensive dissection. It was extremely adherent. So somehow I managed to free the inferior at the temporal part and a little bit of the superior part of the uh, retina of the membranes. And then I put a drop of PFCL just to stabilize the posterior pole. And it was, as I can see from beyond the equator, there is no uh, PVD. There's no posterior detachment. and just trying to remove all those adherent membranes using, still using the bimanual. And once the membranes go beyond the equator, it's extremely difficult even with bimanual surgery to kind of remove off those membranes. So now I have reached the superior area. There you can see I'm trying to dissect off the membranes from the arcade. Yeah, so extremely important to cauterize all the bleeders. Otherwise, they'll all trickle off to the posterior pole and then form a huge clot, which can be difficult to remove yeah so eventually i just cleared off a little bit of the vitreous from the equator from the temporal the inferior and the superior part so after dissection of the superior part i just uh, yeah so i just came to the uh, nasal region and from the nasal region you can see the membrane is actually going up till the ora serrata and i cannot uh, induce uh, any more beyond that and bimanual dissection was becoming extremely uh, difficult so i had no option and i knew that if i leave this membrane it's going to redetach even if i put uh, silicon oil so after filling up uh, more pfcl i could still see areas of traction and the retina was not settling so you can see those extensive nasal membranes and you know it's extending up to the almost up to the aura so then i had no option i lost my patience after one and a half two hours so i decided to do a huge retinectomy in that region. I don't know whether that was a correct decision. So I decided to do a huge retinectomy, uh, leave, uh, remove of membranes from there, and then put in more PFCL, 
completely up till the aura. Uh, did an ILM peeling under a PFCL. And proceeded to do with uh, uh, endo laser. So the PVD is actually not induced anywhere beyond the equator. Uh, just that in the nasal part, I have done a huge uh, retinectomy because the membranes were still there. And after doing a complete laser, I also did a uh, under air did a fluid air exchange, and the retina was attached under air. So I knew that probably it's not going to detach anymore. Yeah, so the retina is uh, flat under air and yeah, I just did cryo to the anterior retina and you can see in this part there is a huge neovascularization at the port signifying that this is like an extensive uh, adherent PVD where the NV is even at the uh, pars plana site and then finally I uh, filled with the uh, silicon oil. So this is the post-op day one picture, nothing much can be made out except that there's a huge break in the nasal region, just uh, nasal to the optic disc. And this is one month post-op. So she's seeing something, counting fingers, close to face vision. And uh, after three months, this is the picture. There's a huge fibrosis at the equatorial region. That's where the, actually the vitreous is still uh, present. And she's able to identify and see something. And this is the post-op OCT where you can see the retina is actually attached uh, and flat, but there are breaks. Which I, uh, which I have lasered. Yeah, so those are those breaks. So discussion, whether to do this case first of all and how to initially find the plane in such cases and roll off different vitrectomy techniques for this and if membranes and PVD is not getting induced beyond the equator to leave or to do retinectomy and put oil and how long to keep the oil in situ because I don't plan to remove oil in her. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting, very well managed case. It was not an easy case at all because we had many, many challenges. Any comments for Tasha? Uh, uh, first of all, congratulations for managing this case uh, so well. So, uh, regarding your first question, whether to take uh, uh, such cases. Yes, it's a challenge, but uh, these cases, even if you don't take, they'll end up in uh, neovascular glaucoma. So I would uh, definitely take it uh, uh, for whatever it's worth. Uh, and uh, we had given Avastin before the yeah, surgery. Avastin was given. Uh, uh, given. So the timing of Avastin is uh, what, what, what do you follow? So cataract surgery was done one week before. At mm -hmm. the same time, along with cataract surgery, we gave Avastin. Yeah. So uh, that helps. And... Uh, uh, the second main thing which uh, I follow is uh, uh, this, um, uh, I will straight away go into uh, bimanual dissection from the word go and uh, uh, for the nasal retina, I have started uh, using a technique called, uh, this was a case uh, right eye or left eye? This was the right eye. This was the right eye. Uh, right eye. So what I do is uh, like how FACO people do uh, the temporal uh, FACO. I also do temporal vitrectomy because in the nasal side, you don't get the angle. So sometimes the uh, degrees of freedom to do the bimanual dissection becomes extremely uh, difficult and you need to uh, cut the retina. And uh, when you shift to the temporal side, make the superior nasal quadrant as the infusion port and the superior temporal quadrant as your light port and the inferior temporal quadrant as the cutter port, you get that much more degrees of freedom. So that can, uh, that helps me. So maybe that can also be tried. Otherwise, uh, nothing much can be done in, in such cases. Whatever you have done is excellent. Uh, really commend. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Abhishek Anand. Dr. Abhishek Anand, uh, also a very dynamic surgeon. He has a YouTube channel called Trocars and Canela. If you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe and uh, do like. So he'll be presenting on a <coughs> how to, to inject or to cut the subretinal puzzle. Over to you. So basically, this is a case which was an intraoperative surprise, and this patient uh, was basically a 
simple regmatogenous retinal detachment and the patient was posted for a surgery and, the, uh, and um, uh, what we do in our uh, surgery is that the block is given in the block room uh, and then the patient is shifted to the OR. But in this case, what happened was there was an anticipated and I asked my residents to put the block and there was almost half an hour of delay before the patient was given the block and shifted to the OR. And this, I think, might have complicated one. Uh, you'll, uh, this is a pre-recorded, I mean, the sound is there. And so instead of a simple regmatogenous detachment, what we get here is a patient with a large subretinal hematoma. And this is a so this is uh, what happened was that the patient, uh, the resident gave the block and she had a needle stick injury to the patient. And the, patient, and the resident never realized it. And it kept bleeding because the high was hypotonus as we have been seeing that, that uh, the rise of pressure is what is required to stop this bleeding and kept bleeding in the subretinal space. And what happened was once I went, to, uh, it came under operation, what we saw was there was a large subretinal hematoma. And what happened was that this hematoma had gravitated on the posterior pole and it was encircling the whole of optic nerve. And uh, when I operated, what happened was that I felt that it was very well organized and very uh, hard to chew. So uh, just see the video. It's a very critical juncture where you want to decide whether you want to abandon this case or proceed. And once you have decided that you want to proceed, you will start looking for some divine interventions. Divine interventions like you will be able to displace the bleed at the posterior pole by massaging using a diamond dust scraper or by using a small retinotomy to extrude the large subretinal clot or by using PFCL to displace the blood. The ominous nature of this subretinal hematoma is more. So if you see this still, you can see that uh, there is a, a layer of subretinal fluid and there is a large subretinal hematoma which is encircling it. And at this point of time, when I realized that ordinary measures are not going to come handy in this case, we proceeded with the uh, with a 360 retinectomy and removal of the subretinal clot. What we thought was a simple thing turned out to be a nightmare for us. More evident under here. We proceed by doing a 360 degree retinectomy, but unlike other subretinal hemorrhage in which you can displace the the clot away from the retinal surface. This is a 360 degree encircling clot around the optic nerve head insertion and it is very difficult to displace it away from the retinal surface. So we have to gradually chew it keeping in mind that vitreous cutter is very very close to the retina. So what we do is we resort to a biomanual dissection in which the one of our instrument is protecting the retina and the vitrectomy cutter is aspirating, dislodging as well as chewing off the clot. But in the meantime, we do it in counter uh, episodes in which there were a lot of hemorrhage and we had to resort to doing a fluid exchange. So what was unique was that when we were trying to do, there was a lot of bleeding also happening and it was clouding our, you know, visual uh, vision. So what we did was we did, you, uh, we did the fluid air exchange and once we realized that the air is itself acting as a tamponade and keeping the retina away from it, we proceeded to chew the clot under the air. And the vasectomy was, was done in order to achieve a better view of, at the posterior pole. As we proceeded with dissection more posterior towards the optic nerve head insertion, we realized that it would be better that if we resort to doing the uh, dissection and uh, removing the clot under air as air would act as a third limb which will protect the retina and keep the retina in a folded space and we will did the maximum amount of removal of clot under air. The retina had assumed a closed onion like configuration and we could aspirate and dislodge the clot encircling around the optic nerve head insertion and eat it with the cutter. A fringe of residual clot was still encircling around the optic nerve head insertion and we, as we can appreciate in the video it was extremely precarious situation with the vitrectomy cutter very operating very close to the retina. Luckily for us and the last piece of the encircling clot we could be able to aspirate it as you can see in this video and this all the point where we are satisfied that we have removed the maximum amount of clot. We unfolded the retina by using 
to forceps and once we have created a sufficient space pfcl was in injected to unfold the whole of the retina sadly though i don't have the video in which you do the direct pfcl silicon ion exchange but we were very happy with the end result of the anatomical restoration that we achieved the posterior pole was flat and there were few bleeding clots at the edges cut edges which were removed post operatively at 2 weeks the retina was doing very well however at at 6 weeks follow up there was aggressive pvr with redetachment under oil so uh, actually i had given this video to one of my friend to edit it and uh, somehow he lost the post operative once we did the p direct pfcl oil exchange and i don't have the video for that but you have to take my words that the retina was well attached on table and till 2 weeks we were happy that the results were good and we could have salvaged this eye but at 6 weeks the patient came with aggressive pvr and Uh, and um, the retina had detached and it was almost we didn't touch the one to press because the activity was so severe and the patient was lost to follow up so i uh, just you know retrospectively when we think we think that should we had stopped at this was abandoning the surgery a better option do a vitrectomy silicon or tamponade or can we have you know modified the surgery in a different way i would like to have panel comment on what would so instead of a simple regmatogenous can you stop the video please get here is a patient with a sir firstly congratulations they, and they no bad luck there is no congratulations <laughs> in such case <laughs> so for even attempting such cases uh, takes a lot of metal so what uh, uh, like uh, the in similar situations where we have a cauliflower of retina uh, so what uh, initially i have uh, like these cases come once in a while so uh, do a uh, water limited vitrectomy and uh, put a pfcl for two weeks and no, no. The, uh, the, the cauliflower position no no was just to intentionally uh, in, the, in this case it was not a very aggressive pvr that the pvr was you know collapsing the whole retina it was just made intentionally that you know it keeps in one position and then you can dissect all around it it was a fresh rd it was not uh, old uh, uh, this because of uh, uh, the risk of redetachment in these cases then doing a secondary uh, oil uh, and uh, is a silicon oil uh, pfcl exchange would in few of my cases has worked so, really so you, well so, so you are, you are saying that i should have left pfcl in this case i think that is a good and valid point i, I actually what has then that i have done left two cases of pfcl and these were all from oro lab and i had a bad experience with them i don't know what is the everybody's view but two cases i have done only two cases till now in which i have left pfcl and that were all of oro lab make and they didn't do that well that so i felt. these cases eventually uh, they will reach the same fate but what uh, the handling becomes easier yeah. so that is what that bleed and all once you have a lot of bleed while injecting the oil that creates pvr the fibrin element is there so ilm peeling was done <laughs> no, I am feeling was not done. <laughs> so, so just to remove of the posterior membranes because uh, you know. No, no, no. this so, was a fresh bleed. Yeah. On table, somebody gave a block and they. Yeah, the correct. Bleed. It was not a chronic something like that. Agreed. Yeah. Sir, case Kumar sir. Yes. Yeah. The greater and bigger lesson that we must probably be learning from these events, it was excellently managed, Thanks. is to be in a situation where we don't have to manage these situations over delegating. giving blocks to residents assuming that they know we should yeah. have a structured yeah. program in place for teaching even this block is- they must try on modelize or uh, cadaverize or something like that and we should be sure that they will be doing a good job of it this is something we over delegate and the land in situations that we have to deal so that is i think the greater lesson that we have to learn. that is a valid point sir and i think uh, one thing that i learned from surgery that i usually used to instruct my residents that my, if my sur- one surgery is completing i would instruct them give a block i should not do that you know just pressurize them that just i need my second case fast just give the block correct you know? and then uh, yeah. the other point was they should also be able to recognize it's not we are all human yeah. and we are not infallible uh, any one of us can be involved in this kind of a situation 
So the recognition of the fact that a perforation has occurred is also important. So yes. that is another thing. And one more point with regard to Ashray Naik's presentation. Any um, reason why you want to have a beveled entry while draining the supracoroidal hemorrhage? Would, would a direct uh, uh, so, cut down not be the best option so as to get out all the liquid liquefied blood? Any particular reason why you thought a beveled entry would be... Uh, Sir, uh, as you rightly said, uh, beveled, uh, like we still use the same straight entry. The beveled entry actually gave me, uh, um, uh, like uh, there was another case where I had a recurrent uh, supracoridal hemorrhage, which was quite rare. So in this, in this case, I just did a beveled thing. So just to have um, uh, more control Some over the bleed. Of... Otherwise, uh, both techniques are... Uh, quite safe and we can do it. Thank you. Okay, now we have Dr. Webov and uh, he is currently a veterinary consultant at Arnodia Desert Eye Hospital, uh, Gurgaon and he will be talking to us on the break that gave me sleepless nights. And uh, this case which I will be presenting is very apt to the discussion we were having that uh, after all we are all humans. And uh, the mistakes that we make in retrospect when you go and analyze, there are a lot of things that we could have definitely done right. There are some cases that you always go through in your career which give you sleepless nights and not all cases have a happy ending. This was a case initially done by me after my fellowship days many years back. And it was a 65 year old gentleman and came to a peripheral center. He was poorly controlled diabetic and had a HbA1c of 9 to 10%. There was diabetic nephropathy and he was post CABG. In the right eye, he had a non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage and vision with hand motions and the plan was to do an MIVS. So before I start the, the, the critical steps in this surgery, I'll just tell you the mistakes I've already made in the space. I have not checked the cutter's function before starting, not just the cutting, but even the reflux. I had, by this time, I had done the core vitrectomy and stained the posterior hyaloid, thinking I'll get a better view with the tricord. But that, as I found out later, made it worse. And early on during the procedure, my endolite shaft had given way. So there was only a light filament, which I thought I'll manage very well with in such a case, but it was a rod which was uh, not the right thing to do. So there were already these things at the back. And so this was the uh, surgical video. So here, what has happened is, there is a dense clot over the posterior pole. And I'm trying to tease out this clot very gradually. And you can see what the tricot has done is, it has made the mat matters worse because the cleavage area, the uh, hemorrhage is now also covered by tricot. So as I'm clearing off, I have uh, made way and found out some amount of plane, which I think uh, would be good enough for me to do the successful surgery. So clearing off from superior to inferior gradually, but what I, what's happening is whenever I'm leaving up the clot, it's not coming out properly, so I go from below up, upwards, try to create a plane here. But what I have not realized is, while doing this, the retina has become slightly bullous. And because of the hemorrhage and the tricot, the view is not clear. So I'm already having a compromised view of the posterior pole. So I still carry on ignoring this fact and clear off this hemorrhage over the posterior pole, thinking I'll be able to get away with it. Now I go with the, with the suction of my cutter, I try to clear off the hemorrhage over the top. But here what I do is, I just go there and here. Oh, and what I did was, I'm, because I did not realize it very properly, I have caught the macula. I am trying to use the reflux. The endolite shaft is already not there and I create a macular break. This break slightly oozed out and uh, 
and this situation very on early in my career I panicked so what are the other steps i did not control the bleeding on time there was a subretinal hemorrhage which trickled down through this break i thought maybe i'll battle it in the second stage did a fluid at exchange laser was attempted around the retinotomy that i created but it wasn't successful so a week later when the hemorrhage did clear up this was the situation the posterior pole and unfortunately the the break i created the hemorrhage had caused already foveal atrophy and this was the break seen on oct cross section so what my crux for this case and when i always before i go in for surgery sometimes it's always important to have a humbling experience something you could have done very very simply and correct so vitreal surgery is gratifying but sometimes can be unforgiving leading to sleepless nights thank you can i make a point please dr vaibha congratulations vaibha i think all that ends well is all that well uh, but uh, you know um, i think one of the biggest um, you know challenges to so where these complications in front of a crowd that is the biggest challenge and i think one of the core that we can get from this video is that we should adhere to the basic principle of dissection and cutting and rather than to aspirating and you know you have to respect the areas of paramount importance i think the cutter was very close to the fovea when because you can do it you know you are uh, at a very high level and you can do it aspirate it and do it away but then time can, sometimes you also get caught you know that you were always doing it so yeah first of all congratulations for documenting and presenting most of us present our wonderful cases the wow cases but the ouch cases also need to be documented and presented for us to learn congratulations on that the second thing which i wanted to make as learners we have all gone through this it's not that you are isolated in this all of us have done these things but most importantly we should never really start off a case without checking the cutter first with the suction and then the cutter on because you are not it, it's almost like a war that we have it's a very thin line and we are really fighting with our backs to the wall in every vitreo retinal case so the margin for error is very little so we should have our armory fully well checked it's almost like a flight you know whenever the pilot sees some alarm he says he will abort and he will come back and then they will say it was a minor error and then they again took off but he won't take chance even with that minor alarm in the cockpit so something similar for a vitreo retinal surgeon also the second point is we should always have backup of a cutter and a light pipe and the infusion cannulas all always should have backup of these three things because if something goes wrong then trying to manage make do with what we have will lead to problems and all of us are as good as surgeon as we can see as they say so crit critical is the visibility at every step in any ocular surgery so if the visibility is compromised for any reason i don't think we should go ahead and keep doing i mean i'm not suggest we have all done this these these are thoughts for the uh, youngsters and uh, for the future generations thank you sir we carry on and now we have dr himadri choudhry with us he has taken out his he has just run from his ic and come here and presenting his lovely case the wrinkled and crumpled retina thank you dr vaiver for this wonderful opportunity uh, i'll be presenting the wrinkled and crumpled retina if i had a second chance i have no financial disclosures so this whenever we talk about crumpled retina it means massive pvi this is the updated classification but i still follow the older classification so in a patient with massive pvr our goal is to ensure complete removal of vitreous remove any detectable membrane and have a sufficient tamponade effect with adequate silicon oil fill i'll move directly to my case uh, this was a 62 68 year old female with a massive pvr visual acuity of hand motions in the last 6 months and this was the picture when we started the vitrectomy so uh, as you can see the pvd could not be uh, achieved right in the beginning and so we have to do a pvd in multiple quadrants uh, different different quadrants one at a time 
the main idea is to get some space in the posterior pole. We try to lift up the anterior vitreous phase uh, from different directions and gradually try to trim the vitreous. We are trying to create some space in the posterior pole so that we can go ahead with the PFCL. We can take help of uh, triamcinolone acetonide and PFCL is used to make the posterior pole flat. Uh, this is a finesse loop. It helps us to lift up the membrane. Uh, sometimes it's very effective, sometimes it's not as effective. So we have to keep changing our options. Here again, we are going in with uh, Brilliant Blue inside the PFCL bubble and trying to use the finesse loop to lift up the ILM flap. Once the ILM flap is lifted, we do a peel. And uh, when you're doing ILM peel, this also helps to peel off all the membranes, PVR membranes. Uh, the moment you do that, you will see that the retina is beginning to open up, but it's a very slow and painstaking process. It has to be done very slowly, very gently, so as to not cause any harm to the retina. The finesse loop is again used to gently uh, put the retina, remove the folds, gently caress the retina into place. If you need, you can go for a restain, simply to uh, remove as much uh, ILM and membranes as much as possible. The moment retina starts opening up, you start filling it with more PFCL. Look at the fixed folds, try to pick up the fold with the finesse loop first and then with the ILM forcep, remove the ILM along with the membrane. So this process is continued till we have a fairly flat posterior pole. Then we go ahead with the painstakingly removing as much membrane as possible. Sometimes it's not possible to remove everything. So then we go ahead with the trimming of the uh, peripheral vitreous. You can do a direct self indentation using a chandelier illumination. Uh, once that is done and we have a fairly good posterior pole and the peripheral retina, we turn our attention to the break. Uh, fluidal exchange is done and then we have a very set, well, well flattened retina. But here we have to see that this is the inferior break. So here I did not do anything to support this inferior break. I thought I had done a good membrane peeling. I had done everything well. I did a silicon oil fill, but what happened is, in spite of all my efforts, this patient developed a recurrent detachment. The posterior pole was still flat. Patient had some vision, around 3 by 60, but she had developed a recurrent retinal detachment. And these patients, after such a long surgery, I recommended a resurgery, but the patient was not willing to go for a resurgery, and in my opinion, uh, this was something which I could have avoided by just putting an inferior buckle in place because this was an inferior break. Moving on to my next case, uh, another patient with a crumpled, rumpled retina. This one had a superior break. So we start the vitrectomy, similar to the first one, again trying to lift up the posterior hyoid create some space in the posterior pole, lift up the, create PVD as much as possible and extend it beyond the breaks if possible. There, was, there were two lattice uh, degenerations, one superior and one inferior, uh, break with rolled edges superiorly and uh, atrophic hole inferiorly. So again, uh, very painstakingly try to remove as much vitreous as possible, trim the vitreous, doing it very thoroughly. Uh, again, inferior, uh, vitreous, I could not actually remove from the uh, lattice that along with the atrophic hole. So starting, I'm using an ILM peeling forcep to lift up the posterior hyaloid. But again, uh, while trimming the vitreous, what happened is I, I created a hydrogenic break. Now, I thought I had done a fairly decent job of trimming the uh, vitreous, removing all the traction from the break. The fluidal exchange was done, the retina settled wonderfully and uh, I did a cryo to the atrophic hole along with the hydrogenic break. I was fairly satisfied with the outcome after the surgery, did a laser, then went ahead with silicon oil injection, but again, another inferior break, another inferior redetachment. So inferior breaks have become a nightmare for me and I don't know how uh, to handle it. So the next time I had a one-eyed patient this time, he had a failed buckle uh, done in a neighboring country and uh, while doing vitrectomy I realized that uh, did, he didn't only have uh, severe PVR, he also had a full thickness macular hole. So went ahead with uh, dye injection and peel the visible membranes as much as possible. 
uh, use uh, PFCL to settle the posterior pole. This was followed by injection of dye inside the bubble and a full ILM peel. Now, once I had done with the peeling of all the visible membrane, I noted that the inferior retina was still very stiff and I had to take the painful decision of doing an inferior retinectomy. Now, inferior breaks, as it is, I'm very scared of, and now here I had to do it, do one myself. Uh, inferior break was, uh, inferior retinectomy was done, and uh, once the fluid air exchange was complete and the PFCL was removed, I noted that there was still some fluid in the posterior pole with slippage of the retina. Uh, because there was a buckle and the break was even more posterior, so uh, the laser marks were also not coming in spite of repeated attempts. Again, <laughs> I attempted to do a laser, do further SRF drainage, but uh, it was just not happening. And I thought that, okay, this one-eyed guy with an inferior break is going back with a recurrence. So multiple attempts to put the retina in place, do some laser. So this is when I thought I had to do something else. So uh, I decided to do something which I'll call ab interno supracoroidal buckling. A cautery was done in the exposed RP choroid complex. And using a 25 gauge cannula with heel on inside, I decided to go in and push it in the supracoroidal space. So as you can see, the supracoroidal space is lifting up. This will provide some amount of buckle effect. So this is looking at it one more time in slow motion. The cannula is put directly into the supracoroidal space through the RP choroid complex and heel on is injected underneath. So this lifts up the RP choroid complex along with the retina and this will provide some buckle effect. This time the laser marks were coming very well and if you look at it now, this is where the break lies and this is the buckle effect. The patient had undergone a previous lateral buckle. So this was at first day post-op, the buckle effect was visible, the retina was attached. One month later, we could see the retina was still attached, the patient had regained some good vision. However, the buckle effect because of the helon was gone, the hole had closed completely. Uh, I have tried this technique in a couple of other cases, but I have not been as successful. Uh, what I have noticed is it is extremely tough to get into the supracoroidal space. So here again, uh, another inferior break, and I thought probably I'll end up with recurrence, so I decided to do a supracoroidal helon. In spite of multiple attempts, uh, I could not get access into this supracoroidal space. The helon just came pre-retinal. So uh, right now, uh, we are talking with a reputed surgical company here in India to develop something which is a supracoroidal cannula with an olive tip. Uh, let's hope if I can uh, successfully do it, I'll be able to show but a few cases uh, in the future. So the learning points are crumpled retinas can be opened up with a lot of persistence. Yeah. Yeah. However, inferior breaks, uh, retinas with inferior breaks have a tendency to recur. And I think whenever possible, inferior breaks need to be buckled. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks, Imadri. Wonderful cases. In the um, situation of paucity of time, I would like to ask uh, Divyansh sure. to continue with this presentation. Thank you, Imadri. Sure, sure, sir. No problem. Divyansh is a young star of uh, uh, young retinal star, so he would be talking on when nothing goes right, go left. Sure. Uh, good morning, all. So this was a case which uh, presented to us with the right eye CNVM and we were treating it as we can see after eight or nine injections the right eye has become like a scar with a dead tree kind of an appearance and the vision has dropped to uh, finger counting six meters. This was in 2021 when the left eye showed some symptoms. So this was a peripapillary kind of a lesion which had started as we can see there is a kind of a C fan around the peripapillary area. Because the symptoms were there, we did an FFA ICG and we could see there was an active lesion even in the left eye and so it continued the treatment. And this is after fifth or sixth injection and considering the patient is one-eyed right now, as you can see the left eye vision has dropped to 660. So what to do next at this point of time considering the PED is high, but yes the treatment of plan of management would be still to inject and this is what has happened. So if after the injection we can see that there is a sub-retinal and even a supracoroidal hemorrhage also, or the sub-RP hemorrhage in this case. So at this point of time, considering the patient being one-eyed, we tried to do the best what is possible, and let's see if God gives us a second chance. So after inducing the PVD, uh, uh, BBG uh, staining of the ILM, and then peeling of the ILM, because the plan was to inject sub-retinal uh, TPA gas, 
And after peeling the ILM, then uh, using a 42 gauge candela, we had injected a subretinal air and a, a mixture of uh, TPA and anti VEGF, as you can see. And uh, this was the post op uh, day one where we can see hazily that the hemorrhage has settled down. And uh, as you can see over here, this is the pre and post where we can see the fundus, we can see the subretinal blood bubble, and the hemorrhage has moved away. But to our surprise, there was a diffuse heme after three weeks. So once you see this, what you should suspect, a retinal detachment. So we did a B scan and we could see the retinal detachment. So at this point of time, okay, the God has given us a second chance, but the second chance is very difficult. As we can see now, the patient has developed a large macular hole and all the hemorrhage has resolved. So at this point, the plan was to how to close the macular hole because there was an inferior retinal attachment. We thought to take a retinal graft and then put it over there. So we did a, a, a larger ILM peeling and then utilized uh, uh, extra foveal graft and then took it uh, below the PFCL and then took it over the fovea. Our plan was to keep it on the fovea, but because there was a PED temporarily, that's why it was not uh, settling well over there. So using a soft tip cannula, I had pushed it into the subretinal space. So this is called as an underlay rather than an overlay. And this is what uh, how it is showing us in the post-op where we can see the graft is very well opposed and the vision had improved also in this case. So this is pre, post, and this is after the second chance we got to put the graft inside. And this is after incorporating the graft, as you can see, the vasculature is also seen very well in, in the superficial capillary vessel network also. So the point of discussion in this case was whether I could have tried the pneumatic gas displacement rather than doing a surgery or peeling the ILM at that point, whether I should have avoided the foveal peeling, which I could I did because of it was easily coming off and nuances of subretinal gas injection, whether it was a toxicity because the gas or the TPA itself and nuances of the retinal graft, whether it has to be kept pre-retinal or in this case as what we did as sub-retinal, either using PSCL or bimanual. And retinal outer graft, whether it should be done at all. Thank you. Can we take up the questions? Do we have time for that? I mean, can we go to that slide? I think I finished on dot. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, uh, regarding this, um, I'll just share my thought process. I think. Uh, Regarding the first question, whether you should go for uh, less, I mean, conservative or very aggressive, I think we have to stress that, that aggressive will obviously work, but conservative also works. That is what the take home message should be. And this patient was one eyed, so in this case, my take would be to go for a less aggressive measure. Might be. I mean, uh, but I was more aggressive, yeah. Yeah, so that is how we'll balance the, uh, that. Regarding ILM peeling, I think if you are injecting something subretinally, I will not do ILM peeling. And uh, uh, regarding the graft overlay or underlay, uh, I have done few cases and I have been able to document that the graft in, uh, anatomically integrates with the retinas, retina, retina, yeah. retina. So I would go for an overlay rather, overlay, than, a, yeah. rather than underlay. So in this case, because there was already a retinal attachment, I had a space to push it and there was a temporal PED yeah. which was pushing it out of the place. So that's why I had used that underlay method. But you, yeah, overlay. You, you use the fluid, soft tip fluid. Soft tip, soft tip yeah. fluid, yeah. yeah. I yeah. would use diamond duster scraper or something. Uh, like diamond dip, yeah. It doesn't have the suction or something. So one more learning point was that avoid peeling ILM over the fovea in such cases because that's the thinnest and whatever the change of forces which occur, it also impacts at the causing of the macular hole, yeah. Shall we close? Oh, okay. Shishir. Where is Bhavo? Can we have? I think with this session has ended and if we can take any more questions if anybody wants. My one small question, uh, especially when you have a huge sub RPE heme, how do you identify where you are going to inject the TPA? Because so, that's true. Have a so I do not have an intra opacity. What I did was a pre opacity and I identified the area where the mound was higher and I could know that, okay, that is the area where the detachment or the subretinal hemorrhage is larger. That's where I had chosen that space. That's all. Yeah. Yes. But so pre operatively, I had assessed that. The time is exhausted, but uh, you are using, uh, during air injection, you are using your hand to inject or you are using well, like the machine pressure to use? So for, uh, so I have used only my hand to inject the air and the TPA combination. Okay. Yeah. So other option is to utilize a uh, machine but assisted also. But it would be very difficult no, to use the machine. So it's I more think. controlled at that point. That's but that true. can be used for, uh, I mean, liquid injections. For gas, can it work? I have not done. Uh, it should, it should, I think, yeah. Close, close, close. Okay, uh, so shall we? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Divyans. Thank you. Thank you, Divyans. And, and with this, we come to the end of our session. And I'd like to thank the audience for being patient and early and uh, being interactive. 
and uh, I hope you all learned something from our mistakes. Thank you very much. One picture.